Are you ready to take your game character creation skills to the next level? In this video, we're diving into the world of character modeling and animation, and I'm going to show you the process I use to create fully animated game characters from scratch. I'll be moving quickly to give you an overview of the techniques and processes involved so you can apply them to your own projects. Plus, I've got lots of tips, tricks and workflow shortcuts to make the process even smoother. And if you're looking for even more in-depth instruction, I've just released a new course on character creation that's currently only $10 for this weekend only. Make sure to check out the links in the description for the discount code. And a big shout out to NVIDIA and PC Specialist for sponsoring this video and making the process of character creation so much easier. So let's get started and create some amazing game characters. So to start with, I bring in the background images and I set them to an opacity of 0.2. I find that's not too glaring and I can see the grid in the background. And I've obviously got a side and front image. Now for the modeling, I start with a plane and I use my auto mirror on that. So it's got a mirror along the X axis. And then I start just building in a face. And although it's not completely random, there is a randomness to it. I just sort of put shapes in, start building it up as I see best and adapt it as needed. I build the obvious sort of edge flow, so around the eyes, around the head obviously, and around the nose and mouth, although I wouldn't call them edge flows as such in this case. I then go to side view and start lining them up. And this is sort of a good 3D starting point to build your face from. And from here, I start filling in the gaps. And it's at this point I realize my side view and front view are completely out of alignment. I continue anyway and just start building up and then look at it a little bit later on and figure out what's going on. Usually I use guides in Photoshop to make sure the head is lining up correctly, but for some reason it kind of went wrong in this case. And you can see I put a plane at the top there to see how it lined up and it was way out. So generally I'm using the front view for everything and just the side view for a rough reference and guide. It's certainly not ideal, but I thought I could get away with it without having to go back and redrawing any references and things. So now you can kind of see me building in the shapes. And like I say, it's not completely random, although it's fairly rough. I'm using simple extrusions of the edges and select a couple of edges and press F to fill to fill in a face. I was experimenting a lot with the amount of topology that I needed for the outline of the shape. So you'll see me go in and adjust it and cut it up and delete edges and add them in as I go. That's generally how I approach a lot of my modeling work. I just think that it's best to start, get something down and then adapt it. It's really common to just get really caught up in the details before you've even started thinking how it's going to work. So just get something down and then adapt it. That's the easy way. You probably saw me there just add in a cylinder. That's a nice easy way to do the neck. It's nice and circular so you don't have to adapt it too much. And you can specify the poly count. So I think I did 12. So that's a good sort of low poly resolution for a cylinder and in this case the neck. And then I just make it match up with the face. So I add in loop cuts where needed and delete them where needed. And in many ways, if you take anything from this kind of lecture, as it were, it is to do just that, in my opinion, start off and then adapt it. Don't worry too much if it's going wrong, learn from those mistakes. And hopefully this shows you that not every person who's fairly experienced knows exactly what they're doing all the time. There's loads of trial and error in all my work. Also, you may see me jump across to sculpting mode every now and again. That's when I've got the topology that I want, roughly anyway, but the shape is out. So it's nice and easy just to go in with a sculpting brush like the grab brush and pull it around like that. You can use proportional editing as well. Now here you can see another good example of just testing things out. What's going to work? Where are there two bigger polygons, two stretch polygons? And where do I need to add in some topology? And here you can see me adding in the ear shape, but it just doesn't really work. You can see those polygons are really stretched. So I get the knife tool, cut it up a bit, and then start adapting and dissolving edges as I see fit. Dissolving edges with Control X will get rid of the edge without deleting all the faces around it. So again, hopefully this is giving you an insight into how haphazard it can be uh, when I'm modeling. And it doesn't really matter too much because I can just change things around, pull it about, adapt things. As long as you get started, get going, you can adapt it as you go. Now at this point, the head's not perfect by any means, but it's good to get the body in there because having the rest of the body in will help you decide on what's working and what's not for the head and I'll start adding that kind of second level of detail once all the body's in. Again, as you can see, it's fairly straightforward, just extruding edges out, getting the rough shape, 
For the arm there, I created a circle for the arm, so the cylinder like I did for the neck. And then when I had that, that's when I attached it to the body. I really do find that so much easier than trying to line up, let's say a few faces and then extrude them out. Get your main edge flows in first and then start attaching them together. And this is where a lot of beginners struggle. A lot of beginners can probably do a torso fairly easily, an arm fairly easily, but they have a great deal of difficulty when it comes to a torso and an arm. So why not do them separately and then just try and create a hole ready for the arm shape and then attach them together. You'll see me do exactly the same things for the legs in just a moment. Now all the time when modeling, I'm trying to reduce the polygon count where possible. I'm not worried too much about n-gons or triangles. That's just part of low poly modeling. Yes, generally I try and keep them fairly tidy as I go and roughly keep to quads, but every now and again I leave an end gone in there and don't worry too much about it. This time for the leg I didn't actually create a new cylinder, I just took an edge loop from the arm, duplicated it and brought it down for the top of the leg. One area that beginners struggle I think is knowing the amount of polygons to use and for me it's just following the reference image in the background and trying to line things up as best as possible. However, you'll probably notice that a lot of my polygons are roughly the same size. Obviously you get some larger and some smaller, but there's not a huge contrast between them. And you won't see any really long thin ones or really tiny ones. I generally keep fairly consistent spacing as that gives a better final aesthetic. And obviously at this point, I'm not too worried about clothing. I'll figure that out as we go along once I've finished the base mesh. And you can see me there jumping back into sculpt mode with the grab brush to just move things around and make adjustments where needed. And you can see me coming back to the face here as well. Now I've got the body in, it gives me a better idea of where I stand. I did jump across to the draw brush for a brief moment, but I wouldn't really recommend that. I'm not sure quite why I did that. It's often surprising how simple you can keep the topology, especially with clothing going over the top. This character's bottom doesn't need an awful lot of work and it can have nice simple topology. So now onto the arm, still fairly straightforward again, nothing special. Make sure that you jump to side view and front view. It may sound obvious, but I see a lot of beginners making very sort of flat characters where there should be quite a lot of arch and curve to a character. The hands is another area that lots of people find difficult and I certainly did when I was beginning. Again, I tend to just sort of cut it up and see where things should go. For each finger, I make sure I have two faces. That way I have six vertices that can create a nice kind of circular look. I grab those two faces and use the to sphere option. That turns it into a circle. Then I can easily extrude out for the rest of the finger. You can see I'm using the knife tool to create some spaces for the fingers. And again, I'm left with a end gone at the top of that, but I don't worry too much about it. You can see me pause just for a second there, figuring out what I was going to do. At the bottom there, I do actually end up having some quads, but I don't worry too much. It doesn't make too much difference and I can tidy it up a bit later on. Now, before working on the fingers, it's a good idea to get your arm position roughly in the right place, as it's really awkward to move the whole arm when the fingers are attached. Try and get everything ready before starting on the fingers. Also, it's helpful to make sure they're pointed in the right direction, and then you can start extruding them out one by one. You can actually create one finger and then duplicate it and match it up with the other faces. I was happy enough just doing it like this. And you can see me using that two sphere option just there to round out those fingers. Then I select all those faces and extrude out my first part of the finger. And at that point, I like to kind of play with the mesh a bit, make sure there's enough gap between the fingers and tidy up just a touch and then extrude out a little bit further. Now, this is another point where I see lots of beginners getting it wrong. Can you see how those fingers just look so not like fingers just at the moment? It's because if you look at your hand, the fingers actually kind of follow a rounded shape. The fingers are different sizes as well. So do look at your hand whilst you're doing this and think, how are the fingers shaped? There should be a curve to the knuckles, not just a flat line, which I see lots of beginners doing. And the fingers are definitely not the same length. So make sure you don't have them all the same length like I sometimes see. When I'm moving the thumb around, I realize that it's not quite the right topology for movement. So I kind of start cutting it up again. And once again, uh, I just cut into the mesh and think I need a loop cut there so it bends correctly and I can just start deleting and dissolving edges that I don't need later on. And I think maybe I'll have another line in there and then I don't need that and I again cut things up and dissolve them until I'm happy with the shape. Yes, this does take a bit of experience, but 
I want to encourage you not to be afraid of doing that and just go in and cut your meshes up and then it's from that and making mistakes that you'll start to learn better topology. So now I start to do the clothing and this character, I'm not going to have them with swappable clothing. So I'm just using the mesh that we've got to build the clothing on top of. If you're wanting to swap out different clothing, then you'll need to actually build the clothing as separate objects. For a lot of this, I'm using the bevel command. So I select an edge loop, bevel it. So I've got two, so I can create a kind of edge lump. So the edge loops being very close to each other, I just scale one up and scale one down and it creates a step. I wanted this character to have slightly oversized hands, a bit of an ogre look to him. So um, I obviously exaggerated that slightly with the hands just there. And again, you can see me adapting the topology to suit the clothing here and this sort of belt area with this huge big buckle at the front, which is possibly kind of like some armor as well. And again, just adapting the shape to suit the clothing. And I do an extra loop cut up the top there because the topology was kind of stretched at that point. So I thought it needed that extra cut. Now this was an interesting one for me, the loincloth. And you can see that I had to make sure the face direction was correct there. You can find that under the overlays. But I must admit, I found the loincloth a little bit awkward because I wanted to attach it to the body so I didn't have too many polygons. I could have had just a completely separate object. But the other problem you get with that, apart from the fact that there's lots of polygons with it, you do have the problem of weight painting, that the loincloth might go into the leg and overlap it. And you have to do all this sort of weight painting to make sure that the loincloth works with the leg. And it can be very awkward and difficult. So as much as possible, I'm trying to make the clothing part of the mesh. The tricky part now is trying to get some sort of muscular structure while still keeping it a low poly character. So you can see me cutting in as I think about where the muscles are gonna to link together. And again, it's just a discovery session where I cut in and think about the lines of the muscles and try and adapt the shape and dissolve and delete things as I see necessary. Often I'll come back to the topology later and think actually I can get a quad in there or I don't need this bit here. And I find it quite a creative process really. And at this point you can really start to see the character emerging and now it's just a case of filling in with lots of details, making sure that minor edits are working. So figuring out the eyes there, I've got to do a bit of the beard as well. And there'll be lots of minor adjustments and small details. And often I find this is the area that separates the amateurs from the professionals. You see a lot more time spent, I think, from the professional in these sort of areas. And there's more experience going into this bit. I think quite a few beginners run out of steam at this point and they look at their creation and think, excellent, that's done. I can now start animating or whatever it might be. When maybe an extra hour just working on some details and some story for the character can really help give it life. And at this point, I'm fairly confident with the character, happy with how it's going, have a good look around, a few minor adjustments again, but I know that I'm going to come back and do a little bit more once the color's in, because when you're adding the colors, you start to notice more issues and things you have to deal with. Now, as I said before, this is all made possible with NVIDIA Studio and PC Specialist. As I'm sure you're aware, Blender's performance is greatly increased by the RTX cards. So here I am in cycles using the CPU to render, and you can see that it's struggling a bit. If I change this across to the GPU and turn on denoise and change it to optics. Now look at the almost instant feedback I'm getting, which makes a huge difference, especially when you're trying to animate, checking if things like the loincloth aren't cutting across the knees and so forth. I quickly get that feedback that I need. The reason I really want to use cycles is that I'm getting a shadow caster on the ground and I really like the nice warm shadows it gives off. And you can see that even if I play this, I get almost instant feedback, which is exceptional. The new G4 RTX 40 series delivers up to a 70% performance jump over the previous generation. And the great thing is Blender uses the RTX GPU to accelerate cycles render and ray trace lighting thanks to the RT cores and uses the AI cores with optics to denoise your scene really fast. I wouldn't choose anything else except the RTX cards. PC specialists are an NVIDIA Studio partner and leading system builders, selling a range of customizable PCs that perform amazingly with Blender. They specialize in custom PCs and laptops for creators and gamers. So configure your next NVIDIA RTX system using PC specialist online configurator today. So back to the model and I'm building the axe. Fairly straightforward, nice and simple, I mirror it both in the X and Y axis, so I only have to model one corner. The only problem is if you do that, it's a little bit difficult when you're scaling 
your extrusions down and up. So I always put my 3D cursor in the middle and then scale by the 3D cursor. So that's changing the transform pivot point. Makes it a little bit easier. For the axe head, I just extrude out just like this. And I do add in some cuts here and you can do that and keep it to quads by kind of doing this technique that you can see here. There's kind of special topology tricks that you can use to keep things to quads yet add in topology. You soon get those with experience. Now I wanted to make it a little bit simpler so I mirrored in the z-axis as well so I only have to model that one corner at the top there but I did have to separate it from the handle first and then I'll rejoin it once I apply that z mirror. And you can see in the modifiers on the right hand side I've got a triple mirror going on there. Then you'll see me apply the z-axis and then join it back to the main mesh and bridge the edge loops. It's just a slightly quicker way of working. I was tempted to put in things like notches and little details in there but it would probably detract from the character slightly so I steered clear of that. The next stage is texturing and you can see I'm adding several material slots here. When I export this to a game engine I'll actually bake those slots out but for now it's much easier to adapt the colours with material slots and then bake them out later. I then start assigning the faces to the different slots once I get the colours sorted. I generally have in my mind what I'm going to do with the colours but it does sometimes change as I'm going along and I see one colour isn't working I might just change my ideas. Now you can see at this point I completely forgot to put in the back of the loincloth which I thought was a little bit naughty so I thought I'd better cover him up. This barbarian's more suited for the cooler climate. I've sped this bit up a little bit more because it's kind of repetitive just selecting faces and adding a colour to them. I might make the occasional tweak on the topology as well if I think something's not lining up or not working and as I spot it I sometimes make some changes. Lots of people often ask how long do these things take, I think this one was about three hours in total but there's a lot of looking at reference images or collecting re reference images that's not including the artwork as well if you can call it artwork that I produce for my background images and that's not including the rigging I'm doing here I'm really only rigging it for the sake of posing it at the moment I'm planning to do some more animation work on this and you can see me just adding a simple rigify rig just so like I say I can pose it and make it look nice for the moment I want to use this in a kind of blender battle that I'm doing later on in the week I'm doing that with my friends at Game Dev TV and we're going to be pitting ourselves against each other. They're going to be in game engines, I'm going to be in Blender and we're going to try and make a small scene. I'm slightly nervous because we've only got an hour to do a whole scene so it might be quite tricky. So keep an eye out for that one. Anyway, back to the Barbarian. For the hands, it's useful to use snap to volume and then you can put the fingers in place nice and easily. Well, I say nice and easily but a little bit easier. Also make sure you've got X mirror on so when you're editing a rig you only have to do one side. And it's all fairly straightforward stuff really. Once the rig's done then I can attach it to my model and start thinking about the weight painting so that's the parts of the mesh that are affected by each bone and you have to actually paint those manually to make sure that the right bits of the mesh are moving with each bone and you can kind of see a heat map here about which bones are affecting which part of the mesh. Now I did want to show this off animated so I was a bit naughty and cheated and went across to Mixamo just so I could quickly add some animations so I'd have something to show but I have been in touch with Rococo and they've sent me a suit so I'm really hoping that I can map out some animations for this character whilst wearing that funny suit. I'm excited about that process but I think it's actually going to be more tricky than it first looks but we'll see. So I sent it across to Mixamo and I thought I'd show you this that there's the different actions and you can actually blend them together in the non-linear animation editor or whatever it's called these days. It's fairly similar to how animations work in games and you can actually when you export the character export the actions with it and you like I say can blend them together in your game and attach them to different controls. And there we have it the finished animation and the finished barbarian. Hopefully you enjoyed this process and got something out of it. Let me know in the comments below your questions or thoughts and of course a big thank you to Nvidia and PC Specialist for sponsoring this video and thanks to you for watching. I'll see you next time.